A lot of the tricky questions have already been asked. Hopefully uh, they've been answered. So that makes it a little bit easier for me. But it uh, lulls you into a false sense of security. Um, I was hoping we'd have a fairly straightforward bit of an amble through the uh, MV project, as we, we call it, and look at that motorcycle uh, that's sitting outside in the foyer. I hope you've had a chance to actually go up and have a look at it. If you haven't, I would recommend you do so you know, on your way out. Um, in the fact that um, in putting together the presentation um, from PowerPoint, I took the recommendation of Justin Hayward, so I'll bring it into the circle of blame already, in the fact that you can actually want, uh, distill the uh, PowerPoint presentation down into a PDF format, which is easier to email, and also embed timings for each of the slide transitions into your presentation. Well, um, we fall at the first hurdle here, because as I move on, for those of you who are not familiar with who Intelligent Energy is, I've now got three seconds in which to actually explain. <laughs> <laughs> so, I apologise for that. Um, what we're really here to talk about, of course, is the Energy Motorcycle, which I'll move on to rapidly. If you do want to know a little bit more about Intelligent Energy, um, I could keep going backwards, forward, backwards, forward, but it's really irritating. Uh, you can speak to myself or my colleague, Dr. Mark Lawson Statham, who's sitting just over there, waving at you at the moment. Okay, so um, what I really want to do, as I've said, is uh, talk a little bit about ENV, um, Emissions Neutral Vehicle. I'm not quite sure what that really means, actually. So again, you can talk to Mark and ask him how that came to be later on. Um, how did the vehicle come into being? That's the first thing to cover in this presentation. What makes it tick? What's inside it? Well, there's obviously a fuel cell because we're a fuel cell company, so that's quite handy. Um, and what may be in store in, in terms of its offspring, the next generation from that bike that's sitting out there. Okay, so um, without further ado, the uh, ENV was actually uh, originally conceived as what we would call a technology demonstrator. It was a platform that we put together uh, really to show off our prowess in producing fuel cells. We're not a bike company, we never intended to be so. Um, we just wanted to make sure that there was something that we could actually grab the public's attention and show that fuel cells were real here and now. So, Intelligent Energy decides that it's going to build a technology demonstrator. So a number of guys get around the table, and gals, um, known as this management workshop, and decide after lots of um, contemplation and lots of wild ideas what would be a good um, showcase to actually uh, show the fuel cell technology off um, and we choose a lightweight motorcycle uh, in order to meet these objectives excite uh, consumer interest by the beauty of concept style um, use this excitement to draw attention to the fuel cell technology that's the real objective and also show our capabilities in being able to produce a compact uh, package efficient package something that um, demonstrates the competence, as I said, of intelligent energy and fuel cell development. So that's all well and good. So we all walk away from the meeting and say, right, let's do a two-wheeler. Then we sit down and think, hmm, this is a bit more of a challenge than we first thought. Uh, I'll just put a few bullet points, four bullet points, essentially, um, that we had to address to actually be able to deliver something which was real, which was demonstrable and worked, and incorporate in our fuel cell technology. It's obvious, really. We had to get it on the bike, and it had to look like a bike, um, in order to actually have some decent performance. Um, the power density of the system had to be acceptable, um, so we had to keep the weight of the system to a minimum. That includes the whole of the powertrain, including the fuel supply system, not just the fuel cell itself. Um, simplicity is key. I mean, that means um, ease of maintenance from our perspective. The fact that the fuel cell is durable, all that should be demonstrable, and ultimately these will all impact on cost. So these things had to be taken into account, we had to have a, um, shall we say, a good go at it. So you see it out there, um, I'll skip through what we came up as the solution to these particular points. The bike as you see it out there, we actually built two of these, these demonstrators. Um, they incorporate a 
essentially a peak power of 1,000 watts or one kilowatt fuel cell system, and as it says there, in a striking modern motorcycle design. The other thing we did which was quite novel, and we thought that this was uh, quite important in letting people know that fuel cells can actually stand alone, don't have to be hybridized um, as they are in the bike, was to be able to actually detach the fuel cell and its hydrogen storage, um, associated hydrogen storage tank, and use that particular um, device to power other things off the bike itself. So what you've got is a hybrid bike, which has batteries and fuel cells when it's intact, so to speak. But you have the option to remove the fuel cell and its hydrogen system, take it away, and power other pieces of equipment. So this was also to sort of try and demonstrate that you could be environmentally friendly all the way through your journey. You set off on your bike, you drive to the uh, national park, you pull up next to the, uh, next to the, uh, the lake, you dip out, extract the core from your bike, you plug it into the electric outboard motor and off you go do the fishing. Um, so, all those sort of things, uh, showing the greenness through and through. Um, interestingly enough, we're not a bike company, we are a fuel cell company, but this is what happened. Uh, an enormous amount of interest out of this. Uh, the platform obviously you know, did what it was intended to do. Uh, Amazing reaction from people who actually just want one, the general public, when can I have one? Journalists, uh, potential business partners, can we make this thing, can we do it with you? Um, our media tracking suggests we've had, to date, and I think that's the latest number, 340 million people have actually been exposed to this. Now, for, the, for those of you, that, if this is the first time, I apologise that we've not got through yet, but still. But that's um, print, web, but it says TV, radio, etc. Um, far and wide, we've shown the, the bikes, uh, one or the other of them, across the globe. And uh, we're still being asked to actually exhibit this bike and to demonstrate it, because it is a running demonstrator. It runs on hydrogen, and you can get on and ride it. So that's the sort of bare specification. Um, it's a six kilowatt motor. Um, it's a brushed motor, very simple, straightforward, uh, air-cooled. It's got a one kilowatt peak fuel cell system in there. It's an air-cooled fuel cell, adds to the simplicity. It's got some fairly standard lead-acid battery technology in there. Uh, to give, again, it's a hybrid vehicle, it gives that performance um, transient capability and that peak capability um, that, that was just talked about in the previous presentation in, in your case in the, in the super capacitor or ultra capacitor uh, in this case it's just good old fashioned cheap lead acid batteries um, again looking at the fact that um, maximum torque at zero speed electric device uh, you see that the acceleration uh, at the low end is pretty impressive uh, even though it's quite a weighty vehicle um, and it starts to taper off uh, as you start to get up uh, as, the, as the velocity rises the bike weighs about 80 kilograms. Um, again, it says the, uh, as we have there, hydrogen storage is a high pressure composite 300 bar Lux per cylinder. Um, stores about the equivalent of 2.4 kilowatt hours electrical energy. Okay. So that's after the conversion to the fuel cell. That's the core. Uh, stripped down 15 kilograms if you take it off the bike. Um, says much the same as uh, I've already said. The only thing to add there is the fact that um, it's quiet. It's incredibly quiet. But the fuel cell, all you can hear if you take it away from the bike is the, is the fans, the air delivery fans that are drawing the air through to promote the electrochemical reactions which um, have been carefully explained for me uh, by the earlier uh, presenters. Solid model of what's inside there. Adds much to it, but there we go. Uh, you can see the tank is the thing that's sitting on the bottom. The regulator, there are actually two fuel cells working in tandem with them in series. Um, everything else in there is just around the valving and delivery of hydrogen, the control systems, the monitoring of the fuel cell. Safety devices, obviously, to detect any hydrogen escapee. That's what the fuel cells look like. Uh, they're actually very straightforward pieces of technology. Um, they, I think we saw from uh, Johnson Matthew, from Martin, that basically all you do is build up a whole series of these things, push them together, compress them, 
membrane electrode assemblies feed hydrogen in at one side, air into the other side, and off you go. So what you can see there is the stack, which is the stack of fuel cells. Um, it looks like a corrugated um, radiator effect. In fact, that's what it is. The heat exchange capability of the fuel cell is achieved by actually blowing air directly through that fuel cell structure. So again, very simple. Um, it's obviously got applications over and above a bike, two-wheeled system, um, small vehicles of any type, uh, UAVs, uh, portable power applications have already suggested through the core. If you move on to the next generation, which indeed we have, what sits out in the, in the foyer and what's the, what we actually use for exhibition purposes is actually much earlier technology than we already than we utilise now. The power density from the system has increased significantly uh, in alignment with what, uh, what's been said earlier. Um, we've now in, got integrated modules with all the management um, and um, electronics that's required to keep that fuel cell happy and operating. Diagnostics are built in. Uh, what you can see there is, is the whole fuel cell package even with its air delivery system. So the black sort of shadow at the bottom there is actually just the conduits which are designed to suck air through the fuel cell stack and then blow it back out of the channels. And you can actually um, see that being exhausted on the side of the bike itself. A complete module which provides uh, at least well, that's 750 watts continuous rating, weighs about three kilograms. You can package that up, because we're now in modular format, you can package that up to, to whatever um, array you would like to utilize. So multiples of 750 uh, are very easily achieved. If you then do some clever power electronics, efficient DC-DC conversion, then you're on the way to actually producing what is effectively the, the fundamentals of an electrochemical engine. What that's showing is uh, a unit which is uh, basically just on a, on a space frame or on a speed frame, but it's actually a development unit for a, a, a four-wheeled um, vehicle. Uh, it's again a 1.3, two, two of the uh, 750 modules put together uh, and ultimately give us 1.3 um, net capability for a hybrid vehicle application. So I'll just summarise the technical pieces that I've gone through, gone through so far. Um, fuel cell system of the type that we're utilising can have a very simple balanced plant. Um, it has a low parasitic power because all you've got to do is draw air through it and close and open a few solenoid valves. So the drawing air through it is actually achieved by very low power fans. Um, it's an air-cooled design, you don't need an external radiator. So the, again, this is a balance of plant benefit. It's actually heat, it's cooled through its own construct. Um, the plates which actually enclose the MEAs, those all precious MEAs are actually pressed metal plate straightforward mass production amenable, has a long life expectancy, certainly uh, the 5,000 hours operating uh, capability is what we're targeting and we're, we're more than comfortable to uh, believe we can achieve that. It's compact, self-contained, got a high hydrogen utilisation because effectively the system is dead-ended, you just put hydrogen in and it just consumes it, throws the hydrogen out as the product which is the water. It's lightweight, it's robust. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, it should go to automatic now. This is what, this is what it should have done. Now it's not going to do it. Now this, I thought it might worth finishing just with how it all started. So it, it wasn't really necessarily going to be a bike, but it did go through lots of sketches of what it might be as a bike. So you see some quite odd things were suggested on its way to actually becoming what it is now. And then slowly it evolved. These are where the three second bits should be doing their job. Not quite there. But you can see the concept of removing the power source. That's effectively the solid model of what you see out there. That's the core structure. And it does exist and it does work. Remember the jerk hitting? And there are two of them. And it 
is striking. So what else could, could come from the MV? Well, there's been a lot of learning, there's iteration taking place, development, and we're looking towards certification of the next generation. These are just solid models. You can see the configuration of the batteries and the fuel cells have changed. It's beginning to evolve into something which should be more street legal. We're looking at lighting cones where you might place the things that make it street compatible. There are uh, mule bikes which are being developed. It might look like that. It also, bear in mind that it utilizes a fuel cell. The fuel cell can go into other devices. It could go into scooters, it could go into something which is a higher power device. Okay. That's it. Thanks